All right, I'm gonna give you guys a uh, view of the federal guidelines. So in this module, I'm gonna provide you an overview of the federal risk management guidelines as I mentioned earlier. I'm gonna talk about the risk framework for FERC and use and the core. We're gonna list some of the fundamental principles that we use for risk management. Uh, we're gonna review some of the key risk definitions and then we're gonna outline uh, what the FERC specific and court specific guidelines are. So let's talk a little bit about the federal guidelines. Um, efforts to write this started back in about 2010. I, they don't they didn't get published in 2015. It took quite an effort just to get to that. Um, it's coordinated by the Interagency Committee of Dam Safety, which is all the federal agencies um, under the auspices of FEMA. FEMA. Um, and at the same time, there's a series of workshops um, that included a lot of different industries um, that the Corps of Engineers had coordinated in 2007, 2008, where we're trying to get a handle on how different in industries use risk as well. So all those things kind of were folded into the federal guidelines for uh, dam safety risk management. But the purpose of this document really is that we have a risk-informed decision-making framework for all the federal agencies that we all agree we're gonna follow. Um, it's also to convey some of the guiding principles that underpin what we were doing um, when we're trying to apply risk-informed decision-making for the agencies. Um, and then really trying to earn, the four agencies really trying to encourage consistent application of risk, risk analysis, risk assessment, risk management, and risk communication for dam owners and regulators, at least for the federal agencies. So, um, so the objectives of this, um, of this document really are to promote the principles that are common, mostly so we're doing things consistently and, cor and uh, correctly. Developing a common understanding of how the, what management processes we use, trying to identify the, what standards we have for safety and, and risk tolerance. And then we're really trying to uh, encourage mutual sharing and development of technical tools and approaches. And I, I'll just say the four federal agencies do spend a, a significant amount of time trying to make sure we're sharing information and being consistent between the four agencies. So the approach is the guidelines describe the overall framework for risk management. It's very simple and straightforward. Um, we describe every process in there. And then for each step in the process, there's some typical uses uh, um, of how these things are done or embedded in the documents. It's a pretty easy read, frankly. Not gonna cover this again, but these are the two fundamental building blocks that, we, uh, that form, form the basis of the document. So. Overall, there are some fundamental guiding principles um, for the Federal Risk Management Guidelines. The first one is life safety is paramount. So you'll notice that the decision making and the tolerable risk concepts that are embedded in the four federal agencies are only around life safety primarily. There might be some economic and other environmental consequences that go into that. Life safety is paramount. Um, we decided that risk should inform the decision process and improve the safety. So we all agreed we were going to move to a risk informed process. So all four agencies have done that. Um, we just we agree that we're all going to try and move towards reducing risk to, for every structure towards a, as low as reasonably practicable. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on ALARP, which is as low as reasonably practicable today. There's a lot of documentation about there about what to do about that, but that's essentially the agency's target for each agency. We also recognize that each agency has a unique mission and authority and legal framework that form what they do, and so there's a limit to how far we can write this document, but within the things that are over the the concepts that overlap between the agencies, uh, we felt like we could write the document that that currently is out there. And the last thing we're trying to make sure that we're doing um, urgent th moving urgently on high risk activities as compared to not moving urgency on low risk activities. So, just the fundamental concept is we we're trying to make sure that the risks and the actions are commensurate with each other. The fundamental principles that underline risk that underpin risk assess, risk analysis for this document is that the basis of a current risk analysis should be coming from potential failure modes. So basically the building block of our risk analysis for all the agencies is a potential failure modes analysis. We also recognize that each dam is unique, has its unique geology, has a unique hydrographic setting, um, has it was uniquely designed and constructed, and so you have to approach each dam as if it's unique. Um, you can't just copy and paste a lot of things from one dam to another. And then finally, a well-constructed dam safety case, which we'll talk a little bit more later, um, includes a discussion that supports and supplements the risk estimates, meaning it's not all just about the numbers. It's about the case we make to support the risk that they're estimated and the path forward that they've chosen. Um, the fundamental principles in our pen risk assessment, um, and I'll say the, the first bullet is a little bit of a minefield, but um, 
Remedial actions should do no harm, and I'll give an example in the core's inventory. We, um, in 2000 and, I don't know, 2012, we'd made a decision we were going to modify two dams in the middle of Houston, Attics Dam and Barker Dam. Um, once we made that decision, they went, came out of a 15-year drought and hit the pool record for those structures three years in a row. When we were doing the alternatives assessment, standards-based approaches would have said build a 25 25 year coffer dam. What we were doing at the time was we were replacing two outlet works conduits. Both of them had pretty significant void systems under them. So we were cutting them out, ripping them out, and putting new ones in. Um, if we'd followed our standards at the time, we'd have put in a 25 year coffer dam. And then when Hurricane Maria came through in 2017, uh, would have wiped out downtown Houston worse than it was um, just because of uh, wouldn't have, the coffer dam wouldn't have been anywhere near tall enough. But when we did that, we actually used a risk-informed process to look at how we were doing construction and decided to build the coffer dam the same height as the dam and ultimately um, didn't inundate uh, downtown Houston. We just inundated the upstream. Um, that was a several billion dollar difference. And I, I, the point of that is, and this happens a lot during seismic modifications and sometimes during spillway modifications, um, be careful introducing risk in while you're trying to do construction and when you have your eye on long-term safety improvements. Um, I believe the industry has been a little bit careless about that. I think they're taking more risks than they, than they realize uh, when you're constructing modifications to structures, trying to address safety and not paying attention to the, what you're doing in the interim. So the agencies wrote this document in there to say that remedial actions should do no harm and I think you should follow that and be, be cognizant of it as you're going along. Um, well, so said decisions to be risk informed not risk based we're not slaves to the number um, the number gives you a piece of information but there are other aspects of the decision that need to be considered and then we also all agreed that while we're contemplating long-term um, improvements to safety we should take some interactions and we should document them so if, if we, each of the four agencies has their own policy on on interim risk reduction measures but um, they all do cover it um, there's some fundamental principles that underpin risk management for the agencies. So the objective of each organization is to reduce dam safety risk as efficiently and effectively as possible. Make sure we have a transparent, transparent process for identifying how we prioritize those activities. Um, while keeping a nod that there's some flexibility in prioritizing with, uh, work within a portfolio, meaning um, sometimes issues come up and you have to reshuffle everything you're doing um, just to take care of the high priority issues. We also agree that they're using a de the best way to approach risk assessment is to use a dedicated established group to review and, pro and prioritize proposed dam safety actions. And so for the most part, um, the four agencies do that. That's a little bit more of a challenge than you, you might think. It's a little easier for me and not as easy for Doug, I'm afraid. But, um, but we all agree that that's the, the best way to approach this. And we do that in you know a variety of different ways. As a part of that, we all agree that independent review is critical to the credibility of the process. And so whether it's on an individual project or for the programs overall, um, each of the agencies have an independent review of the processes and of the decisions. And then the urgency of completing the actions should be commensurate with the risk, which seems uh, fairly straightforward and obvious, but we did write it down. And, and then I'll just say the, probably the, the thing that agencies, all of us do least well is uh, risk communication. Um, it's rough. Um, Raise your hand if you got engineering because you love people. Now, not a single one of you did it. Yeah, that's an industry problem. <laughs> um, in the whole dam and levy industry, we have a bunch of people who would rather talk to their shoes and maybe you're out of somebody else's shoes, but not talk to people. And so we're struggling, honestly, as, as the agencies with communication. Um, but we all agree it's really important. It's really important for people to understand the risks that they're exposed to. It's really important to understand what, why we're taking the actions we do. It's important for us to communicate with emergency management agencies. And the emergency management agencies and their emergency action plans are critical to how we communicate risk. Um, but we, we all believe that the risk should be open and transparent. So we try and communicate as much of the risk as possible. Um, we also are trying to focus on um, communicating the benefits of the structures that we're around. So whether it's a dam or a levee, you know, having being focusing on the benefits as well as the risks um, is usually very helpful. 
we're trying to communicate early in the process. Um, that's a bit of a challenge for some of the agencies, but really um, getting information out early is um, a benefit to us all. And then we're trying to focus our communications on the individuals and organizations that need to t that uh, on the actions people need to take. And so um, there's a lot to go to the risk communication. We're, I know we're investing millions of dollars in risk communication, and I'll just say that the four agencies just recognize it's really important. They're trying to be transparent about how we're doing uh, all the activities we're doing. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the definitions because it'll be important for the rest of this uh, course. So risk is a measure of the probability and severity of an adverse effect to life, health, property, and environment. In risk analysis, it's what we use to estimate risk. So I talked a little, talked a little about, about it a, little, a bit ago in the green boxes. Um, but really, uh, risk analyses contain the following steps. We scope the de we define the scope, identify the hazard, and estimate the risk. So that's what we're trying to do when we're doing a risk analysis. When we try and evaluate the risk, it's trying to look at the numbers and other things to examine the significance of the risk. And so this is where you kind of look at the social, regulatory, and legal aspects of it, value judgments on part of the owner or the regulator, whether they're implicitly or explicitly, including considering the importance of the estimated risk, uh, social, environmental, and other consequences, trying to evaluate alternatives to manage risk. So it's really kind of all the other things that come into a risk analysis. Risk assessment is the process of making decision recommendation whether the existing risks are tolerable, preventing risk measures, and present risk measures are adequate, and if not, what we're going to do about those. So it incorporates the risk analysis and the risk evaluation into that phase, into that to make a risk assessment. And then risk management is really a management policy that each of the agencies has or the owner has uh, to identify, assess, analyze, communicate, and mitigate, and monitor the risk. So all these are in the federal guidelines. So now I turn it over to Doug, and he's going to tell you how FERC does theirs. So good morning, everyone. I'm Doug Boyer with the FERC with the Rhythm Branch uh, in Portland. I wanted to give you a bit of a background building on what Nate talked about on the federal guidelines for dam safety, because that has become a very foundational document for us within FERC and starting the risk program. But wanted to take a half a step back, give you a bit more understanding perspective of this journey we've been on within FERC in kind of contemplating, evaluating, and getting to where we're at here today in looking at risk and how we think that that could actually benefit the program, not only from us as a regulator, but as licensees as well that, that have TAMs. So, a little bit of a timeline here. So, uh, for those that have been tracking in late 1990s, FERC began at least opening the idea of, hey, what is this thing about risk? We had been watching the Bureau of Reclamation, Board of Engineers were starting to do some things even at that point. we wondering, as, as those two with, with um, its owners, you know, from, from a federal perspective of dams and us being a regulator, could that maybe transfer to us as a regulatory agency in being able to implement that? What would that look like? What kind of concepts, plans, et cetera? So we began those discussions. And then in 2002, uh, that intervening period, teams were formed, started to talk about things and development of that very first edition of Chapter 14 of our engineering guidelines that included uh, an identification of, okay, potential failure mode analysis. What does that look like? What will it what will it look like in implementation on that? And later that year, uh, in, in 2002, was the very first PFMA that was performed. Anybody here know, know which dam in the FERC inventory had the PFMA? Brown Butte Dam in, in Oregon was the, was the very first PFMA that was performed. We, we had like a $500 cash check for anybody that had that answer. But I'm just, just kidding. So in the mid-2000s to the, to the late you know, the 2000 here, uh, FERC started doing a couple of uh, pilot studies at, at the request of licensees that had particularly challenging uh, topics or issues that they wanted to be able to understand and address and felt like risk would be probably a really good approach to be able to help do that. So 
Norway Oakdale with some spillway adequacy issues and with upstream and downstream consequences, as well as Ashton Dam in Idaho in trying to look at some internal erosion and what kinds of alternatives might be better in trying to do this, what Nate talked about earlier, no harm during the construction of this. So started to look at that, FERC began to get a, a, a bit more comfort, I'll say, and understanding how, the, how risk could be used in the regulatory program. So shortly thereafter, in our strategic plan, a five-year st strategic plan in 2009, laid out a five-year framework to say how we could evolve through uh, doing a, a deeper dive and evaluating risk from a regulatory uh, perspective, and then all the way to implementation of what, what would that actually look like in uh, 2014. So again, just a plan, right, in, in going forward. So in 2010, uh, internally, a couple of, or actually three dam safety engineers off to the side to say, okay, let's start really thinking about what that actually looks like in our regulatory program. What kind of guidance are we going to need? How does that get implemented again from that regulatory perspective? 2015, the risk informed decision making branch was formed uh, officially. And then Nate talked about in 2016, you know, we have been working in that intervening five year period in trying to help develop these, these the federal guidelines for dam safety risk management. So we used that document to be able to help us in developing our risk-informed decision-making guidelines that we were working on starting in 2015 after the public publication of this. So again, this document addresses four main topics and, and Nate covered each one of these. Risk analysis, risk assessment, risk management, and risk communication. So we took those as kind of four legs of a table, so to speak, and, and we built our guidelines based on that. So in 2016, we, de we developed and, and published our, as interim guidance, and, and even as today, it's still interim guidance on risk analysis, risk assessment, risk management, and, and chapter four has risk communication embedded in it as well. So those three main chapters, chapter two, three, and four, provided a bit more content an approach to how FERC would like to be able to proceed in, in developing risk-informed decision-making approaches, processes, and procedures in being able to evaluate dam safety. It goes all the way from inventory and screening level risk analyses all the way up through the decision-making process. So chapter two talks about risk analysis. So what risk measures, what types of risk are we gonna be looking at considering? Again, from a regulatory perspective, talking about what the risk teams ought to look like and what risk methodology ought to be used and all the way through the documentation and how those independent reviews need to be, uh, need to be done. Chapter three goes into risk assessment. So what is tolerable risk? What factors will we look at in, in evaluating tolerable risk, including things like ALARP as low as reasonably practicable? What kinds of, of input, what kinds of information make the case for, for that? And the whole decision-making part, again, as, as Nate had laid out earlier, again, building on what, what was done in that FEMA document in 2015. But then finally, chapter four goes into the risk management part. So, so you've done the, the numbers crunching, the work part of it in, in chapter two. You've done the evaluation and decision-making in chapter three. So what do you do with that? You know, we don't want to stop at chapter three. We, we, we need to be able to move into that risk management. This has to be a tool for us to, to improve our damn safety. So how do we classify the risks? How do we prioritize risks to be able to get things done? What kinds of risk measures, both permanent and interim risk reduction measures in going forward? Can these, these um, results be able to inform a routine program as far as improving our inspections, improving EAP and enhancing that, including our, our monitoring programs? And then finally, risk communication. So all of that is embedded in these chapters that were published in, in chapter 16. In, 2016, sorry. So again, referencing back to this, this FEMA document in 2015, that document identifies five different, they call it types of risk analysis, starting with potential failure mode analysis as that building block, all the way up through screening and periodic risk analyses, and then looking at issue specific risk analyses and even uh, risk analyses are performed for risk reduction, trying to identify maybe what alternatives might give you the biggest bang for your buck, so to speak. So again, building on that, using that as a reference, this is where we've developed the, the nomenclature, the terminology for this level one, two, three, and four for the risk analyses. 
So I'm assuming many of the folks here from the, I'll say from the FERC perspective are saying, hey, you just published kind of chapter 17 and 18. I have a comprehensive assessment or a part 12 coming up. I want to understand better, you know, what you have in there. So the level two risk analysis, the one piece that we had left out of this 2015, I'm sorry, 2016 document of which chapter 18 fills that plug that we left intentionally wondering kind of what that was going to look like. So that really chapter 17, chapter 18 really comments and, and completes that overall risk management uh, program and documentation that, that we were looking for. So again, we go from the screening level, so from an inventory kind of base risk analysis to this periodic risk analysis that's performed on an ongoing basis, like for our comprehensive assessments. The level three risk analysis as kind of the entry level into issue, issue evaluation studies. If there hadn't been a level two analysis, level two risk analysis already done. So both of these, level two and level three, equate to the terminology that we use as SQRA. So you see this SQRA versus L2RA, it's, it's not a competition. It's just how we've chosen to kind of separate out how we make our, our uh, evaluation or identification of a risk analysis. Is it part of a comprehensive assessment or is it not? It helps us uh, within the program. Confuses everybody else, so I apologize for that, but it's how we're looking at it. And then finally, level four. So this, this is getting into the more quantitative risk analysis, issue specific risk reduction measures when you need something more robust in the decision making in trying to decide what you need to do. Do I take action? Do I don't take action? And, and what direction do I go? So again, with, within our 2016 interim uh, rhythm guidelines, we talk about these different levels of risk analysis. And again, each one is designed for a, a particular purpose, for a particular decision. All the way from prior, trying to prioritize at the very basic level from a screening standpoint, which dam should I be most interested in, to trying to prioritize within that, that system, to actually trying to make decisions. So you can think of it almost like climbing a pyramid, you know, the, the foundation, the, the screening level is, is the least amount of effort, least amount of information, the quickest, uh, quick and dirty kind of approach to just trying to get a sense for, you know, where would I start to the, the level two risk analysis, again, which is part of chapter 18 of our new guidance that have, that's come out, all the way up to the more complicated, more robust, probably more expensive typically on that but, to, but trying to make uh, much more critical decisions, I'll say, at that point. So, so the level two risk analysis, what are we, from, from a FERC standpoint, trying to get out of it? What do we see as the ultimate purpose? Well, again, as Nate talked about, this is kind of the introductory level where we're looking at evaluating a specific dam and using potential failure mode analysis as that foundation to be able to move forward. We want to be able to inform dam safety decisions for which, which uh, failure modes we need to take some kind of action. That action might be just looking at additional engineering studies, investigations, and things like that in a way to be able to prioritize that. In addition, from that standpoint, looking at, you know, how do we, what kinds of uh, information uh, studies, things like that, do we need to help inform those kinds of decisions in, in moving forward? Providing some input to operations and maintenance, surveillance and monitoring, enhancements of EAPs, some of those things that, that inform the and help uh, our our routine routine dam safety program, and just to overall just provide a better understanding of potential failure modes. You know, as we've looked back, I'll say over the years, I mean, you know, FERC's been doing and the licensees consultants have been doing PFMAs for 20 years, you know, and going through that process. I think we had hoped that at the onset of that early on was that we would get, I'll say, a bit more clarity on how to proceed from the PFMA uh, process. I, I don't think we had quite enough information to be able to do that, you know, in the sense that we would come out of some of these PFMAs, and, and many of you know this, you, know, you might come out of a PFMA session with 65 or 70 category two failure modes, right? And so you're trying to figure out, what do I do with all of these failure modes. How do I prioritize this? What's really important from this? We have different failure modes. We have different loading conditions. We didn't have a way to kind of compare apples to apples with all of that. And so you, you could make your own case for just from a judgment standpoint, what you felt was the priority in moving forward. I think with, with the kind of the advent and being able to take this PFMA to that next level, 
we're building on all that information. Now we're going to look at it from a risk standpoint. We're going to do some risk estimation, some risk evaluation. I think that we will find that that was the missing piece. I think we were all looking for. Uh, for, for many, many years and helping us to be able to prioritize the kinds of actions and activities we, we, we really want to be able to take and have that be transparent and being able to share that information, not only with the regulator and hopefully have concurrence and agreement with that, but also internally within your programs and being able to make the, the argument of, of perhaps why more resources it might need to be provided to this, whether that's human resources, that's financial resources in being able to move forward. So I end with this. I don't expect you to look or be able to read any of this, but I wanted to give you just the kind of the concept here. So this is a figure again out of, of our 2016 risk informed decision making guidelines. And just to give you a kind of a uh, an idea of where our, our level two risk analyses are, are really down here in the foundation. It, it forms the rest of the process from the rhythm process that we're looking to be able to do. We're trying to prioritize activities here. And, and if the risks are, are not tolerable, if, if there's something that we get out of that from a conclusion to move forward, then we'll march up through the rest of the process to see how we can use that. But that should only be failure mode by failure mode moving forward, you know, to be able to do that. Otherwise, if, if the risks are considered tolerable, Let's come down here and as Nate was showing, you know, we'll just go back out through the routine policy as far as a loop and 10 years later, you'll do another comprehensive assessment, see what things look like at that point. So just as again, just want to give you a quick overview of, of kind of how this all fits together before we get into the nitty gritty later on the, this morning and this afternoon about talking about PFMA and risk analyses and things like that. Okay, let me turn it over to Nate to talk about the core approach. All right, thanks, Doug. So I'm talking a little bit about how our guidelines were developed, similar to uh, what Doug had for FERC. So in 2006, we had a team put together to uh, write our policy and guidelines that was internal and external to the core. Um, in 2010, it took us about four years to write the guidance that we were really done writing in about 2010. It's published in 2011 as the Dam Safety uh, Engineering Regulation. Um, it's basically unchanged since then. There's been some minor updates, um, but we did revise how we look at tolerability in 2020. And I'll talk just a little bit about that. I think Andy talks a little bit more about that later today. And then in 2021, um, we finalized the, dam or the levy safety uh, policy, which is in an engineering circular right now. So it's taken us a good solid 15 years to get from where we started thinking about it to getting an actual levy policy, um, both policies for dams and levies in the core. So, um, how many of you have read a dam safety reg for the core? You're crazy. The thing is 800 pages and it's a bananas thick document. Um, so we're currently revising it right now to make it be a lot shorter, but it's a monster of a document. Sorry about that. Um, it covers everything though. It covers, um, Dam safety officer responsibilities for districts to delegation of authority, there's all kinds of stuff in there. Um, but really it's how the core complies with federal guidelines for dam safety. Um, really it ensures that everything we, we've designed, constructed, known, and op is operated safety and, uh, safely and effectively. And it's, it's, there's a lot of words in the document. And it's very thorough though, I'll give, I'll give it that. The building blocks of how we're looking at things for our guidelines is we do a routine risk assessment for dams and levees every 10 years. Um, either screening or semi-quantitative. For dams, it's through a periodic assessment process and it is semi-quantitative all the time. If out of that process we think we might have a problem, then we go to an issue evaluation study. An issue evaluation study is semi-quantitative. We might do some advanced analysis, might do some field exploration, we might do some you know, numerical modeling. Um, seems like we always do a hydraulic analysis or hydrologic analysis. And it can be quantitative as well. So depending on the, if the decision really needs us to be quantitative, we'll go down that. Scoping of issue evaluations is really a big deal for us. If we come out of the issue evaluation study and we know we have a problem, then we take some, we look at alternatives to take actions to reduce risk. And so we do a mod, dam safety modification study where we, at the end of it, we're trying to have a decision document on behalf of the agency that says, here's what we're doing to, to minimize risk. 
there's a planning process in the core we generally follow, and then ultimately you select a plan to do risk man to do risk reduction at the end of this. So that's the general process we have um, for dam safeties, dam safety studies. So let's talk about live those individually. Periodic assessment is a routine dam safety um, activity. It consists of an, of an inspection, typically a periodic inspection. Uh, we also do a potential failure mode analysis and a semi-quantitative risk assessment. We do every 10 years on every structure we have. And so we're not trying to develop much new data. So we're trying to use whatever data that we have available. Um, we provide, we have a, a, a consistent pool of facilitators that go out and do these. And, um, but most of the risk assessment is actually done by the local personality that the district, um, well, at the district we have. Um, what we're trying to do is evaluate the design, construction, analysis, performance, and the condition of the structure, including the vulnerabilities and the associated risks. We're trying to look at the interim risk reduction measures plan. We're trying to identify what operations, maintenance, and instrumentation and monitoring, and management activities and other ongoing needs that, that are available. We're trying to identify and prioritize what we want to do for data collection, analysis, and, and what we want to do any further studies. But what it does is it allows us to prioritize our risk management activities. So coming out of this, um, when we get to what we call the senior oversight group that reviews all these, um, we look at the existing risks and we look at the follow-up actions and the, recommend, the recommended actions from the team. We also recommend um, to the Corps Dam Safety Officer what the risk category ought to be. So every, um, every structure in the Corps has a, an action classification, just trying to categorize it into generalized risk uh, groupings from high risk to low risk. So it comes out, so every dam gets one of those assigned at the end of a periodic assessment. So for issue evaluation studies, it's a little a lot more detail. Well, it can be a lot more detail. It can be a little more detail or a lot more detail. It really depends on what the nature of the issue is. Um, but we're trying to determine whether there is an issue and what the urgency of the actions are should be for that. So uh, it's scalable. And I'd, I'd say it's, that it really is scalable for this. We, they're, they're, these run from, I don't know, 600,000-ish to $12 million. I mean, it can can really vary wildly in what you spend on an issue evaluation study. But we use one or two approaches. We either use a semi-quantitative approach that we're talking about today, or we use a quantitative approach um, with a more powerful team. Interestingly enough, um, as we, really high risk things are not that complicated to estimate risk for. I mean, things that are obviously, you know, broken is not that hard. As we move closer to the total guidelines and the issues become a little more challenging, we actually have to invest a little more effort in the risk analysis, trying to reduce some of the uncertainties because the decisions are not as obvious as they are when, when, when the issues are as obvious. It's a little bit counterintuitive. Um, I know there's, uh, a school of thought that you should spend less on things as you ha have less risk, but that turns out not to be the case necessarily. Um, we found that there are about three key um, approaches to doing a, an issue evaluation efficiently and effective. One is really having the same team and an experienced team committed to the full duration. Sometimes if they last several years, if you're doing field exploration, what you can have a lot of team members come and go, and that doesn't necessarily help your, your issue evaluation go well. Um, Scalable scoping, to, so really understanding what decision you need to make at the end of it and scaling what your effort to that is really important. Um, and then for us, having everybody uh, engaged all the way through, uh, for us, so the decision makers at headquarters is important for us. So those, those things help if it, issue evaluations go on. So here are the potential outcomes for dams. For a periodic assessment, either we're going to say we don't have to do anything more, return it to the routine program, or we need to take some action to reduce some uncertainty and go to an issue evaluation study. Those are the only two decision outcomes that come out of a periodic assessment. For an issue evaluation study, again, there's only two outcomes. Either you go back to the routine program, we feel like everything's addressed, or we need to take action to reduce risk, and we're going to study that in a modification study. And again, coming out of modification study, there's only two potential actions. One is we're not going to do anything, which does happen sometimes um, for a variety of reasons. Or we need to take an action to risk risk, and the, and the coming out of that is the actual risk management plan, the selected risk management plan. So there's not a lot of choices coming out of there, but um, a lot of times coming out, no action um, wins a lot, which is good. Be really concerned if it was the opposite. Um, so that was dams. So for levees, it's a little bit different. Um, so the levy safety EC out there is a lot different than the dam safety reg we have. It is more of a high level document. It just talks about the high-level policies of how we manage our program. It's organized into four main parts, uh, the governance aspect of it, risk assessment, risk management, risk communication. And so it's a little bit organized a little bit differently than 1156. 
The next dam safety reg is going to look a lot more like this in, in a lot of respects. Uh, but these are what's really covered in the, in the levy safety guidance. It's talked about how we do inspections, um, when we do inspections, it talks about risk assessments, when we do those, it talks about operations maintenance, it talks about how we share information um, through typically the information that goes in what needs to go in the National Levy Database. And then it talks about the National Levy Database. Um, so there's, uh, it's, it's a really high level document. It doesn't cover a lot of the aspects that are actually embedded in the dam safety reg. And the reason it, that it's a lot different is the chart on the right, which is really the, the amount of the levies in the, in the nation that are federally authorized. So if they're federally authorized levies, they're in the core system. But you can see we only own the green ones. So we own and operate the green uh, pie in this chart, which means most of those projects that, we are, that are in there, we regulate essentially, and they're owned and operated by someone else. So we, the document is written a lot differently because ownership and decision making is a lot more shared. There's a lot more sharing of, of the decisions on the levy side than there are on the dam side. So it's just a little bit different from a governance perspective. We do a lot of levy screening, so this is a little bit different than the than the dam side. The dam, we did a screening process. So it was called Screening Portfolio Risk Assessment. We did it from 2006 through 2012, and we don't do that anymore. We're still in the screening process on on the levies because we're trying to make sure our entire portfolio. And we're also very close. I think we're just really left with um, levies we were finding that we didn't know we had. Um, but it's a routine activity, and we've developed a really incredible tool to do this it's called the Levy Screening Tool. Um, and the version 2.0 is going to come out here. Uh, well, the, I think it's we're using it, but it's in beta right now. And it is a lot. It's it sort of spans both semi-quantitative and screening. It's kind of a, a, an interesting tool. But we've done screenings on a 10-year cycle, so we same, same thing as Dan's. We're going to do risk assessments routinely. Um, it's based on the segment. Um, we again use just existing information um, about the, and we have a very rough consequence um, uh, tool in there. Um, it's usually done by the two to four people, uh, either local district. We've had some consultants help um, some of our local districts do that. And then really the core and the levy sponsor get together and develop a prioritized list of recommendations coming out of that screening. Um, what it really has done so far is really built the risk awareness of the sponsor in the community in some ways. Um, and well, in, in a lot of cases, it's been a lot different than what uh, we'd anticipated going in. And then just like with dams, we try and classify the structure um, in a risk kind of category. Um, so SQAs and, and QAs for levies. So typically when we do SQAs, we, we rarely do a quantitative risk assessment unless we have a, we're doing a multi-hundred million dollar capital investment, which does happen, but not very often. So semi-quantitative risk is kind of a medium effort. Uh, we use core engineers approved facilitators, uh, and then it, that's could be the core employer, could be a consultant that we, we've approved. Um, the team includes the core district, the levy sponsor, or it includes a, a cadre we bring in of experts that we have internally and the district and levy sponsor. Most of the effort, though, in the SQRA for this, for levies and for, um, what we're doing here is to understand the failure modes. And what it does for us is it results in a more accurate risk estimate, sort of within our magnitude of where we want to be. And so it kind of gets us a, a decent estimation of risk uh, trying to support whatever, whatever decision we're trying to get to. QRA typically is about alternatives, and I'll just, I'm not going to read through all this, but they can be very sophisticated and also expensive. Um, and we put a lot of investment in it, but it really, we don't. I wouldn't use it on anything that was less than like a hundred million dollar of a capital investment, or or if the population risk wasn't more than a thousand. There are a lot of different reasons we do a levy risk assessment, but really they come out of two directions. One is if a sponsor initiates that, that means either the sponsor is trying to get a credit, use us to do accreditation of the National Flood Insurance Program or they are part of a uh, permit application to alter a federal project, meaning put a pipeline across or a uh, stop sign or, you know, there are a lot of different ways to do that. But so if a sponsor wants to do that, we will, we will help or we will review the risk assessment that's done to support those things. The core can also initiate it. And really, that's really if we have a, a cost shared feasibility study, typically um, we, will, we will ask for the risk assessment to be done as part of that. It really helps us inform how we make decisions for both dams and levies and for in our in, to, in our governance. 
Well, we use it to inform a lot of things. We use it to inform how we do emergency preparedness. Uh, we use it to see what data collection and analysis we need to do. We do it for portfolio management. We do it for looking at feasibility studies. Probably the biggest thing we do on here actually is dominating all of risk assessments in the core overall is uh, National Flood Insurance Program risk assessments. We're doing a lot of those right now and um, permit applications for to modify federal structures. Uh, so I want to give you guys an opportunity to ask questions about what you've seen so far today. Well, but yeah, so we just covered FERC and the CORE's guidelines. Usually this is a point where Doug has to answer a lot of questions. So this is your time. I know you're kind of drinking from the fire hose on that. So, but we're going to talk about, I'll flesh a lot of those details out for the rest of the day. So uh, you mentioned the lagging of the risk communication process. What are the agencies doing to try and improve that process and, and this whole risk uh, area, arena? Well, I, don't, I can't speak for Doug on this one, but um, we have hired a lot of communication specialists, honestly. Um, I have three in my office, so Austria had zero, um, but we're, we have a very robust risk communications team that's trying to help us communicate in English instead of a series of clicks and words. Um, so uh, we're trying to invest a lot in how we communicate. Actually, you're seeing some of the results of it. I think you know what we're doing here and and some of the learning style things that we've done have, have been a direct result of what we're trying to invest in communications. But I still feel like we're a long ways away, but we're trying. So Doug was talking about using risk assessments at FERC and kind of a regulatory role. I kind of work in the 408 program in Sacramento. We're just starting some of our kind of risk assessments. I was wondering if there's been any nationwide coordination on kind of risk assessments in a regulatory role for the core, at like the 408 and maybe lessons learned from FERC or anything. Uh, well, work for, for pretty, well, a lot. Um, you know, it was all, all this stuff was developed for regulators. Honestly, it's kind of interesting you say that, but um, the 408 guidance that the core has, basically says call us right well, call us and we'll walk you through it because it's a little bit of a challenge to try and scope out everything we have in guidance so um i actually haven't we haven't seen many issues with the full eight. you know they've been a pretty the sponsors been pretty good about uh talking to us before they start one uh, and i haven't seen anything go totally off the rails yet it's, at least with respect with respect to that 